Good evening. Uh, welcome to uh, the BOW sponsored uh, webinar uh, tonight. We've got 60 participants already uh, online. Welcome to you all. Uh, this, this talk is, uh, this webinar is going to be on the advances in urethral stricture management and it's sponsored by uh, Labory and Eurotronic. Uh, you will have briefly seen the agenda and uh, the, uh, the faculty in the waiting room, but just to go through it this evening with you, I'll be uh, starting the discussions off with some optimizing approaches to endoscopic management of urethral strictures. Uh, I will then pass over to uh, Dr. Sean Elliott, uh, Professor and Vice Chair of Urology at the University of Minnesota. He'll be talking about mechanical and medical therapies that can perhaps uh, improve outcomes with urethral strictures. And he will then uh, pass on to Dr. Carl Coutinho, who is uh, a reconstructive urology, urologist currently practicing in uh, New York City and remarkably the only reconstructive urologist in a practice of over 170 urologists, so he must be a busy man. And Carl's going to talk about the Optolum drug-coated balloon in more detail. If you want to uh, ask questions, there is the Q&A uh, available at the bottom of your screen, and we'll be collating the questions, uh, which will be used as a, uh, a forum for discussion at the end of the session, Please don't use the chat, uh, just concentrate on the Q&A. There will also be three polling questions, which are uh, through the, the talk, where you have the opportunity to answer a multiple choice question to get an instant uh, view of the audience uh, feelings about certain aspects. Uh, so if we then just quickly remind ourselves of who we are, I'm Professor Nick Watkin, I'm Professor of Urology at St. George's Hospital London. I specialize in genitourethral surgery and, and have been involved in clinical trials uh, of urethral stricture management in particular. Uh, professor Sean Elliott, a professor and vice chair of urology at University of Minnesota. He also is a, a recognized expert on urethral stricture disease and has been the, uh, the secretary and treasurer of the Society of GU Reconstructive Surgeons in America. And uh, he's also been principal investigator of the uh, trials of Optolume. And Carl Coutinho, as I mentioned, is, is a reconstructive urologist who trained in Mount Sinai and uh, hospitals in Chicago and Cleveland, who also is the only reconstructive urologist in his practice. So uh, in terms of conflict or interest, I don't have any. Uh, Sean mentions that he's been the PI of the three Optolume trials, Robust 1, 2, and 3, and also a consultant for Boston Scientific. And Carl has been an investigator in the Robust 3 trial. So let's begin with some optimization strategies for the management of, of urethral strictures. And really, we're talking about penobulbar strictures throughout this uh, webinar. So let's begin with a recent case, which just happened pre-COVID. Uh, this was a 50-year-old man uh, who'd had uh, one endoscopic urethrotomy, a DVIU, uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, and he'd had a cardiac stent placed uh, the year before and was on uh, clopidogrel. He had a urethrogram, which you can see on the right of the picture. The uh, upper slide showing an ascending study, the lower slide, the descending study. And clearly you've got a tight mid bulba stricture. Uh, the specialist he saw uh, suggested a buccal graft urethroplasty. And the patient wasn't sure what to do. So he requested a second opinion and uh, came to see me in my clinic. So what are his options? Well, obviously he could have a urethroplasty uh, and one could debate whether it was an anastomotic urethroplasty or a graft type urethroplasty. He could have a second DVIU, um, which had lasted about 10 years from his perspective. He could have a urethral dilatation and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. He wanted to know what outcome he could expect from the different types of procedures. He also raised the issue of self-dilatation and whether that would be helpful. He wanted to know if he was going to have a urethral catheter and if so, for how long. He hadn't really enjoyed the experience from his recollection. 
And he talked to me about whether things could be done under local or needed some kind of uh, deeper general anesthetic because he'd had his stent and was slightly nervous about, uh, about that aspect. So I'm going to just highlight some of the guidelines that might help formulate your opinion. And ones that I, I personally was involved with are the British Association guidelines, which were published uh, last year. And you'll see a number of statements that we um, made. Uh, the first, uh, that basically a DVIU or a dilatation could be curative if this was a first procedure for short bulbar strictures and that there was no evidence in the literature that one was better than the other. Uh, for obvious reasons, we recommend that you should use a, some form of guidance, either a guide wire or a ureteric catheter to define the lumen to minimize your complications. And that's particularly relevant for DVIU. And that you should be careful to use, uh, make sure the urine is sterile and provide appropriate antibiotics. And we said that a catheter should be left in for three days, uh, full stop. So the, the next statements are slightly more contentious. Uh, the group said that uh, dilatation or DVIU could be used for recurrent strictures, but was essentially palliative, not curative. We then said that clean self-dilatation may have a role again in palliative management of, of men with strictures, but was not curative. We made the statement that there was no role for stents in the curing or palliation of men with strictures. And finally, we said that uh, any new device that became available must be tested under NHS uh, clinical governance arrangements. We then concluded by saying that urethroplasty was the only curative option for men with recurrent bulbar strictures. So whether you agree with those statements or not, uh, you could choose uh, the, a number of other guidelines which have been published. Obviously the AUA's guidance from 2016, uh, which recommended against repeat DVIU. Uh, the SIU produced a consensus statement in 2010 which suggests that maybe you could consider a repeat DVIU if it was a favorable stricture. In other words, one that perhaps was short uh, and that recurrence had not occurred early. And in this case, we define the early as three months. I'd commend you to read the EAU guidelines from 2021, uh, which is their first attempt at stricture guidelines. And it, it was a particularly well-researched and well-written document and they concentrated additionally on the importance of symptom scores and the use of validated questionnaires to guide uh, the patient's choice. But all of the guidance, if you put them together, would say the following. It would say that DVIU and dilation had equivalent outcomes, that DVIU should be offered for untreated short bulbar strictures, but to not perform repetitive DVIU or dilatation if urethroplasty is an option. So what do we advise this patient? Well, he's bothered by his symptoms. That's, that was confirmed to me. He was nervous about COVID and anesthetics in general. And he wanted to know more about the evidence for repeat endoscopic treatment. Well, uh, I obviously told him about DVIE, which he knew about, and this has been popular for 50 years. Uh, nothing, nothing new from the, for the audience, I don't think. And the evidence was, was really driven by the paper from uh, John Blandy in, in 1983, and some of the great and the good of British urology were co-authors of this paper. And they basically said that after five years, 50% of patients who had a, a DVIU didn't need further treatment. And remarkably, at that time, 80% of patients, or more than 80%, actually relapsed with urethroplasty. So if you were faced with the evidence 40 years ago, you would clearly be choosing DVIU. And it, it basically defined the next 20 years of, uh, of uh, endoscopic care. Um, a few years later, Chris Hines uh, in... Uh, in South Africa did the only randomized trial to date comparing endoscopic treatments, uh, and that was DVIU versus dilation. Uh, and basically there was no difference in outcome between the two. And that's driven again 
the evidence that, uh, that the guidelines uh, are stating. He, he showed that after one procedure, you'd get a 50% to 60% stricture-free rate at four years. After one recurrence, it was 20%. But after a second recurrence, it fell to 0%. And we have the most recent data now. This was published uh, just uh, three or four, well, just before Christmas, actually, in, in European Urology. And this was the results of a randomized trial that uh, was originally uh, conducted uh, by a multi-center team based in the UK. Uh, and uh, 200 patients were randomized to either uh, a urethroplasty, which was a bulbar urethroplasty, or uh, an endoscopic urethrotomy if a patient had had at least one recurrent, one stricture recurrence. And this is the, the basic summary data. Uh, what we found at two years uh, was that 38% of patients randomized to urethrotomy had recurred and recurrence was really defined by uh, return to baseline of symptoms, flow rate and so forth. And 20% of the patients randomized to urethroplasty also had, uh, by definition, a recurrence. Uh, in terms of re-intervention, uh, the numbers were slightly less because people had perhaps delayed their uh, choice to, re to be uh, uh, reoperated on. But similar figures, really, 28% of patients randomized to urethrotomy had had a re-intervention and only 16% of patients that were randomized to urethroplasty had had a re-intervention. And you can see on the kaplan meier curves, these, this data uh, projected graphically. So perhaps one could say that the, the, the difference between ureth urethroplasty and urethrotomy was not really as great as one might have expected from the historical literature. Um, but this is only data at two years and, and obviously we don't know uh, what would happen in subsequent years. So at this point, I'm going to pause and there should be a polling question coming up onto your screen. So this is poll question one uh, to the audience. In your experience, what is the typical number of dilations or urethrotomies uh, a patient receives before being referred on for a urethroplasty? And you have four choices of one, two, three or more more than three, four or more, I should say. Okay, and here we have the results. So the, the mean number looks like it's, or the median is 40% uh, would have two urethrotomies and 29% uh, at three and 17% would have four or more urethrotomies. Okay, uh, hold that thought, and I'm going to now pass you over to uh, Professor Sean Elliott, who's going to talk about some additional uh, adjunctive measures for, uh, for urethral stricture management. Thank you, Nick. Uh, so I'm going to focus on talking about uh, advances in endoscopic technology, I should say, for the man management of urethral strictures. You know, the most basic one would be uh, in, in terms of the technology we have and, and the data that's out there would be self-dilation. Uh, self-dilation does seem to improve the success rates over just standard uh, internal urethrotomy or uh, surgical dilation by the urologist. As long as the patient keeps doing the self-dilation, the stricture stays open at a higher rate than people that don't do self-dilation. But once they stop doing self-dilation, the recurrence rate is just as high as people who never did self-dilation. And this is demonstrated in these two uh, randomized trials uh, by Kiergaard and uh, Bodker listed here, where in, in one of these trials, uh, people did self-dilation for a year, and had an 80% success rate after DVIU plus dilation versus 25% if they only did the DVIU, showing that persistent dilation has a better success rate, self-dilation. 
And then in the other trial, they only did the self-dilation for three months and then assessed the outcomes at one year and that showed no benefit. So it does seem to show that stopping the dilation makes the stricture eventually come back. So I would do away with this notion that you hear some people say where self-dilation kind of stabilizes the stricture and uh, that you can do it for a little while and then just stop. Um, if you think the data there in those two randomized trials is a little bit old to believe, um, there's also this more recent case control study uh, in the Scandinavian Journal of Nephrology uh, demonstrating higher success rates with self-dilation than with DVIU alone. You know, there have been changes in the dilators that have been used over the years. No one's really studied whether one type of dilator is better than another. Um, I, I've even known some doctors to prescribe a balloon that the patient can use to inflate themselves every other day to keep the stricture open. So uh, people really are uh, trying many different therapies, but we don't know if one works any better than the other. And um, uh, if you go to the next slide, I believe it might talk a little bit about one of these. Um, uh, it, it'll be a future slide. I'll talk about uh, dilators that are coated with steroids. But before I get to that, let me just finish up on this self-dilation uh, and why it's not a fantastic long-term option is that it's associated with a poor quality of life, especially in young men or people with proximal strictures. So this data is from Alan Mori in Texas. Um, there's a little bit of a selection bias because he only surveyed men who were referred to him for urethroplasty. Um, so they'd obviously already made up their minds that self-dilation wasn't the way for them. But when he asked them about their quality of life on self-dilation, uh, the predictors of poor quality of life again, were the younger men, they didn't tolerate it as well, or the people with very proximal strictures because it's more invasive to self-dilate a proximal stricture. So in my practice, I, I'll use self-dilation for fossa meatus strictures um, because it's uh, you know, a little less invasive, they don't have to go so deep, uh, or in some men who are uh, either bad surgical candidates because of medical comorbidities, um, or just aren't interested in urethroplasty, um, or may have very difficult to successfully correct uh, strictures, like maybe some uh, after uh, prostate cancer therapy. This uh, data was touched on a little bit by uh, Professor Watkin a few minutes ago. Um, this shows you what the success rates are for endoscopic treatments, uh, he mentioned that dilation and internal urethrotomy have the same success rate and that the success rate goes down with successive therapies so that at about one year, uh, internal urethrotomy has about a 60 to 70% success rate if it's the first internal urethrotomy or the second one. But once it gets to the third time, the success rate's very low at one year and uh, zero by the second year. So if we want to improve the success of uh, internal urethrotomy or dilation, I mentioned earlier, one way to do that is with permanent self-dilation, but are there things we can do during the uh, DVIU uh, to increase the success rate? And, and that would be things like, uh, you know, can we inject a steroid or inject mitomycin C? Uh, there's over 20 studies out there, about half of which are randomized trials. Uh, demonstrating the effectiveness of these different medical adjuvant therapies. Uh, the most common ones that have been studied have been steroids and mitomycin. Um, it's been shown that if you do intermittent self-catheterization with a steroid-coated catheter, or if you uh, do internal urethrotomy plus steroid injection at the same time, that this uh, it delays the recurrence, meaning that uh, I think it's after six months, their success rates are better, but then eventually after one or two years, their success rates are no different from people who never had the steroid used. Um, mitomycin does seem to be effective. Uh, if you pull the multiple studies out there, the uh, risk ratio of a stricture recurrence is lower than people without mitomycin. And uh, I, I'll say a few words about whether we can believe those data or not. Um, 
Other ways to inject to use mitomycin include intraurethral uh, in, uh, squirting rather than injecting into the tissues. Uh, you can use hyaluronic acid squirted into the urethra. And and the I guess the qualification uh, that I would add to all of these studies is that the although they're randomized trials, oftentimes uh, the quality of the studies is pretty poor. Um, the outcomes are pretty variable. Sometimes the success rate is defined by cystoscopy, other times by symptom score, other times by freedom from, in, from intervention. Um, the, uh, the dosing of these drugs is rather inconsistent. Um, you know, how much dose was given each time, uh, how it was given, you know, how many cuts do you make with the urethrotomy? And then after you make the cuts, how deep do you inject the drug? Um, and in which location do you inject the drug? Uh, and, and then lastly, uh, I think this all leads to some high risk of bias. Um, and then in my own hands, I, I would say I've had complications with mitomycin injection. The complications have mostly been in people with prior radiotherapy, and we've published those data before. Uh, people with radiation plus mitomycin injection, uh, we've seen a necrosis of the bladder neck and calcification in that area. But I've had good results with it, especially in uh, vesicourethral and astomotic strictures after radical prostatectomy, as long as there's no radiation. I haven't personally used it though in the anterior urethra. So the optolume here, which is a mechanical and medical therapy all rolled into one device, um, provides the uh, you know your typical balloon dilation which uh, stretches open the uh, urethral stricture and then also creates micro fissures for the drug uptake. The, the, the drug is coated on the outside of the balloon. And the idea is that the paclitaxel uh, reduces uh, collagen formation during this acute phase of wound healing. Um, and perhaps some advantages over the studies that I just showed you using things like mitomycin and steroids could be that we have uh, consistent dosing of the drug. Um, the same amount is on the balloon every time. And then consistent drug delivery because it's delivered circumferentially and it's up to, taken circumferentially through these micro fissures rather than using a needle to inject it in one or two spots in the urethrotomy. And uh, perhaps those injections are occurring uh, a little bit deep and, and not right where the, uh, the drug needs to take, take action. So the, the uh, Optolum device has been uh, studied in a few different trials now. We have uh, Robust 1, 2, and 3. Robust 1 and 2 were both single arm studies. Robust 1 was in Latin America. And Robust 2 was the same design just in uh, the United States as a confirmatory study. And then Robust 3 is ongoing, and that's a randomized placebo controlled multi center study. Um, and that one is in the United States and Canada. There's about 22 sites in Robust 3, and Robust 1 or 2 or fewer sites. We enrolled 127 people in Robust 3 and uh, a, a few dozen in robust one and two. Uh, Follow-up is planned for five years for all of these studies. And you can see there that for robust one, we've published the two-year data, uh, which I'll review in a minute. Robust two, we've submitted for publication the one-year data. And robust three, we're showing you here really for the first time, uh, six-month uh, interim data. In Robust 3, um, I should say that uh, what happened is we randomized people to either the Optolume drug-coated balloon or standard of care in a two-to-one fashion. Uh, and you do that because that provides some incentive for the men to want to enroll because they know they have a two out of three shot of getting the drug-coated balloon. For those who got standard of care, it was up to the surgeon. They could do rod dilation, DVIU, or plain balloon dilation, and you see the percentages there. A little more detail about these studies. Uh, the stricture length uh, generally was one to two centimeters, um, with about half of them being slightly more than two centimeters. Um, the number of prior dilations was several, especially in robust two and three. 
these men had on average uh, three or four previous dilations. So these are definitely very high risk strictures. And I don't show it here, but several of them had SP tubes in suprapubic catheters because they were in complete retention from their stricture. Uh, these were primarily, but not, uh, not only bulbar strictures, 10% were penile and robust three. And the etiology was kind of all over the map. Um, I'll point out that 11% of the men in robust three had previous radiation. And here's the success rates. I'll show you a couple of graphs and the color coding in these figures is consistent uh, across the different figures to help uh, with interpretation. So we've what we've done here is combine the results from robust one, two, and three all into one graph. And I, I'll, I'll try and explain why I think that's quite helpful. In each graph, orange is the control group from robust three, of course, uh, because robust one and two were single arm. And in dark blue there, you see the pooled success rate in the uh, intervention arm, uh, if you were to combine the results of robust one, two, and three, and in kind of a, a lighter blue is the, um, and, and, and it's gonna be the one with the shortest follow-up just out to say about 12 months is going to be the uh, intervention arm in robust three. The first graph here compares the IPSS scores over time. And you see that the IPSS scores uh, rebound to being high in the control arm, and they stay low in the uh, intervention arm, despite which study you're looking at. And I think what's pretty neat is to see that in robust one, two, and three, the results in the intervention arm are almost always uh, the same as each other. It's the same thing if we look at uh, Qmax as an outcome. Uh, the Qmax uh, declines over time in the control group but stays good in, the, uh, in, in all three studies of the intervention arm. And then here's the real, uh, the real money shot, if you will. Uh, I, I, you know, I congratulate um, the makers of the Optolume, uh, Eurotronic, and um, I, I congratulate them because they were willing to do what I think is a, a high bar for success, which is to have all of these men get a cystoscopy at six months to see if the stricture was open. And this uh, gives us, I think, much more objective data and will really strengthen people's ability to believe these results rather than just looking at, say, IPSS scores. Um, and uh, obviously what the patient feels is very important on IPSS scores, but it is great to see that the anatomic success rates uh, map out with their subjective symptoms. So regardless of uh, which of the three studies they were in, the intervention arm patients had 75% patents, 75% of them were patent on cystoscopy at six months, and the control arm was 27% patent at six months, which pretty much maps out real well with Chris Haynes' paper that we uh, reviewed earlier. And then uh, the last outcome would be freedom from repeat intervention. And uh, this obviously introduces some bias because each surgeon may have a different threshold for repeat intervention, but uh, it, it, is, um, it is what uh, sometimes a healthcare system might care about. And you can see here that in the control group, almost all of them have had repeat intervention by one to one and a half years. And in the active arm, uh, the uh, repeat intervention rates are uh, quite low at about uh, 20%. So we have a uh, little uh, poll here. Um, reflecting back to the data we showed you uh, from the Haynes paper, and I don't know if you could bring the slide back to that, uh, that graph uh, for the audience, but compared to the data from the Chris Haynes paper, um, in your experience, uh, would you typically find that dilation or endoscopic therapy is actually more successful than seen in the Haynes paper, just as successful as in the Haynes paper, or less successful than is in the Haynes paper? So it looks like people pretty much agree with the results from the 
from the paper, a few people have had better success. And I and um, certainly different people have different success depending on their, their techniques for endoscopic management. Um, so I believe that concludes um, my portion of the talk and I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Carl Coutinho. Thank you very much, Dr. Elliott. Uh, appreciate the uh, introduction as well. Um, my name is Carl Coutinho. I'm a reconstructive urologist uh, working in the actually the New York City area just across the border in New Jersey. I'm fortunate enough to be part of a large group of uh, about 170 urologists uh, and uh, the only reconstructive surgeon there. And because of that uh, good fortune, I've been able to treat a lot of urethral stricture disease and uh, treated 29 patients using the Optilum drug-coated balloon in the ROBUST-3 trial. So what I wanted to speak to you today about is just some of the technical tips and pearls that I picked up doing the procedure that would help you with doing the procedure and uh, talk a little bit more about the technical aspects. So uh, obviously uh, we're all familiar with this diagram. The strictures in question uh, as part of the robust trees trial, we're all uh, interior urethral strictures. So uh, obviously we avoided um, strictly prosthetic urethral strictures and any sort of bladder neck, uh, you know, focus with this uh, balloon. And that's what the data is kind of describing. About 60% of all strictures are actually uh, anterior. So that encompassed a lot of patients. And, and that's why we were able to drive enrollment uh, in our trial to a high number. So this is just kind of a picture of what the balloon looks like. Now, the balloon itself is a pretty standard dilation balloon, if you've ever used one before, for urethral strictures. Um, the difference is uh, the drug. The drug is not new. Pacotaxel has been around for a long time. It's that combination of the two with the recipient or the, uh, the medium of transferring the drug from the balloon to the lumen of the urethra, uh, which is new. So the first step in... The procedure as part of the clinical trial was mechanical dilation with a non-drug coated balloon, which opens the area of stricture out, creates these micro fissures, uh, this raw, these raw edges for the drug to be uh, introduced when the drug coated balloon was, uh, was placed. So as part of the trial, we introduced a non-drug coated balloon, a regular urethral dilation balloon, inflated it uh, for about uh, five minutes, uh, deflated it, then ensured that the stricture was open into at least 20 French and then proceeded with our drug-coated balloon. Now, I will say in the future, uh, and we, we repeated this as part of the trial uh, because it was part of the, pr the protocol, but in the future, you know, some of the things that we were describing is, you know, not necessarily having to use the uh, pre-dilation uh, on certain strictures. The reason we did it here is we wanted to make sure that all patients were treated once and thus the concentration of the drug that was given to them was the same for every patient. And I can talk more about that later. So the next step, uh, and we saw a picture of this before along with this graph is, is inflating the drug coated balloon. So the drug coated balloon is inserted over a wire and under cystoscopic guidance, uh, and fluoroscopic guidance as part of this trial, we inflated uh, the drug-coated balloon for five minutes and then uh, deflated this. Now, the drug is imparted then on the urethra, and you can actually see it under cystoscopy uh, throughout the urethra in a circumferential manner, in a very even manner. As you can see here, um, and what we talked about previously, the drug allows an inhibition of cell division and cell growth, which is inhibiting stricture recurrence. And that's really the secret, you know, to this, uh, this drug's effect on urethral strictures. In animal studies, the drug was seen in the urethra throughout this process of wound healing at 30 days later. And once the pharmacokinetic trials come out, uh, we'll see that it was really undetectable in the bloodstream after about an hour. So it's very localized in the, urethral, in the urethral lumen. The device itself is a pretty standard drug-coated balloon. It does not pass through a standard flexible cystoscope. So if you're using a, a cystoscope that's flexible in the office, for example, uh, you would need to pass the, uh, a sensor wire or a wire next to the scope and then insert the, um, the device over this wire. 
for this reason, after a couple of these, after our first couple of these patients, we started using a rigid cystoscope, uh, a standard 21 French rigid cystoscope. We were able to pass the guide wire, uh, 0.083, I'm sorry, 0.038 uh, inch sensor wire through the scope, and then we were able to pass the balloon through that. We, I inspected the uh, the nipples very carefully to make sure that you know there wasn't anything that was kind of rubbing off uh, in terms of the drug on these nipples or in the scope, and I didn't really see any. But that brings us to kind of our next. Uh, oh, and one thing to mention: the lengths of these balloons vary. So there's a uh, a, a 30 millimeter length uh, for shorter strictures and a 50 millimeter length or five centimeter balloon for the longer strictures. And we'll talk about how to choose the length in a little bit. Um, 30 French is the, the most commonly used diameter during the trial. So again, the secret really is the coating, uh, the excipient, which is the medium that allows the drug to be transferred from the balloon itself onto the lumen. It requires the balloon to uh, be introduced into the urethra and then sit there uh, coated in uh, saline until uh, for about a minute. So this kind of hydrates the tissue and then allows and facilitates the transfer of the drug from the balloon itself onto the urethra, onto the lumen of the urethra. Uh, and I think it's that process of keeping it there and allowing the uh, the drug to hydrate, the balloon to hydrate, which prevents it from really touching anything else as it's being introduced into the scope. Paclitaxel, as we talked about before, is an antiproliferative uh, medication. Uh, the whole idea is that it's been shown to limit fibroblast uh, migration via its effect on microtubules, uh, thus limiting fibrosis and inflammation and, and preventing these strictures from coming back. There's also some research showing its effect on sig signaling pathways, including uh, transforming growth factors, uh, which are influential in um, this whole formation of an extracellular matrix, uh, which facilitates the stricture formation in the future. The whole idea of uh, durability, uh, you know, in animal models, like I said, it's been shown uh, uh, to last for up to 30 days in the urethra and in um, the half-life in the urethelium is thought to be about three to seven days. Uh, it is rapidly um, absorbed into the tissue and it is res uh, resistant to washout because of its lipophilic nature. And you can see that when you're actually doing the procedure, if you have a camera and at the same time, the crystals kind of stick to the lumen of the urethra and they don't wash out so easily. So the advantage of the Optolum balloon is, uh, in, in my opinion, the best advantage is really it's circumferential and very even distribution of the drug. So that I think is the main you know, and that's the reason I'm a main proponent of this device, as opposed to injection therapy, which I've used for, uh, for example, bladder neck contractures with mitomycin, where there's, uh, you know, some variability in which tissue is getting the medication and which tissue is not based on uh, the surgeon themselves and also the patient's anatomy. Uh, the hydrophobic uh, drug is absorbed rapidly, as I said, and resists, um, you know, urine washout immediately after and remain, remains in the system, uh, as I said, in animal models uh, throughout the wound healing process, uh, thus preventing scar tissue formation again. So in, in summary, this is a, a standard urethral dilation balloon which is delivered via a guide wire and placed into the exact location, either under visual or fluoroscopic guidance. We use both as part of the trial protocol for the uh, robust three trial. The recipient, which is the coating, which facilitates drug transfer, requires hydration for roughly one minute in saline. Uh, and then the drug itself, once the balloon is inflated and makes contact with the walls of the urethra at the area of stricture, is antiproliferative and not only uh, prevents the scar tissue from coming back, but the actual physical action of the dilation, which we did via a non-drug coated balloon and also the drug coated balloon, um, stretches that tissue out and facilitates the transfer into microfissures in the tissue. So as I mentioned before, there are two lengths um, for this uh, drug coated balloon. You really wanna make sure that you have an overlap of about a half a millimeter or so. Um, uh, five millimeter, I'm sorry, excuse me, half a centimeter or so, five millimeters on each side of the stricture. 
Um, that gives you two things. Number one, if there's any sort of minute migration of the balloon during inflation, that gives you some, some coverage. Uh, it gives you uh, a little bit of uh, protection if there's any migration. And, and also, you know, the whole idea of spongiofibrosis and the thought that repeat DVIUs lengthen strictures because of its effect on healthy tissue on either side, um, this is treating the uh, so-called healthier tissue on either side of the stricture, uh, which may be prone to formation of stricture in the future as well. So you want to make sure there's overlap. And, you know, thus, you don't want to use a five centimeter uh, balloon which would be the longest size for a stricture uh, that is more than about four centimeters. So we're going to show a brief video here, and I'm going to stop a couple of times, just highlighting the actual procedure itself. All right, so important things to, to understand is once the, the packaging is removed from the outer box, there's also an inner packaging as well, and that's to protect uh, from light exposure, protect the, uh, the device itself from light exposure and to keep everything sterile. Um, it comes with, uh, you know, what, we need to, what you need to have is obviously a guide wire, um, you know, your cystoscopic equipment, either a flexible or rigid scope, um, your, your, um, your saline irrigation, as well as contrast media if you're doing a uh, retrograde, uh, but also to fill the balloon so you can identify exactly where you're inflating it in addition to visualizing it uh, via cystoscopy and a small Foley catheter for the end of the procedure. You can see here the device kind of been prepared. Here's the wire coming out. And the key here, um, I'll pause right here if you would. Uh, the key here, this is the drug coated balloon uh, at the end here, which is white, and it's protected by this uh, plastic uh, uh, coating, the shield that's on top of it. So one of the keys is making sure, especially if your hands are wet, that when you remove this protective plastic coating that you don't touch uh, the drug-coated balloon portion with this, this white matrix, which is really uh, the drug in the recipient. Um, to anything that's wet or really onto anything other than putting it onto the wire and sliding it through the scope. You can see uh, here again, minimize, minimize uh, the handling of the device. Now here, uh, I'll ask you to pause for one second. Uh, the surgeon is using a, um, a rigid scope. And then on this next uh, portion here, the surgeon is using a flexible scope. So my recommendation, having started by using flexible scopes uh, in a surgical center environment, uh, where I had rotating staff that may have not been familiar with, you know, uh, the device itself, um, I was struggling trying to have two hands on the scope itself to keep it in the correct position and, and trying to talk uh, my assistant through sliding a wire next to the scope and then sliding the balloon over that and then inflating the balloon in a proper fashion. Uh, it became to be a lot. And so we switched after our first couple of patients to a rigid scope, as you saw in the first, uh, the first section uh, right before this part. And that allows you to have control with one hand on the scope sliding the wire um, and the drug coated balloon yourself through there and holding it steady as your assistant inflates uh, and deflates uh, the inflation mechanism uh, to 10 atmospheres. So I highly recommend if you are uh, doing this um, to do it with a, a rigid scope. Of course, that means that your patients will have to have some sedation um, in the future as uh, it, you know, if you have the capabilities in your office and good help, um, it's possible to do this uh, you know, in, in the office with a flexible scope. Uh, but if you're starting off, I, I highly recommend using a rigid scope with some sedation as well. So the balloon is inflated uh, in a standard fashion uh, using a uh, pressure inflation device to 10 atmospheres. And so as we inflate the balloon in the stricture, you'll see that the, the atmospheric pressure uh, in the balloon will drop off a little bit as the, as the stricture gets uh, stretched. So we're constantly you know, increasing that to 10 atmospheres to keep it at that level for about five minutes. You can see that here fluoroscopically while the surgeon is observing with a flexible scope. You can see here the drug after deflation of the device coating uh, 
in a even manner, uh, you can't really see the bottom here, uh, the ventral surface, but in an even manner, the entire urethra and overlapping the area of scar tissue, as you can see further in. So following treatment, the balloon is used and disposed of. Um, we used a, a, a standard uh, biohazard disposal method. And the idea is not to do anything or touch anything or manipulate the urinary tract after this. So don't pass the scope through that area, kind of remove everything and pass a small Foley catheter. We inserted 14 French Foley catheters uh, that were silicone on most of our patients. As a precaution until the PK trial gives us more data on whether or not the drug is, is still in the semen or in, uh, in the uh, urine, we've recommended to patients going through the trial not to have sex for uh, a two week period no sexual activity for a two-week period, and then uh, for uh, sex, uh, use uh, a condom for sexual activity for 30 days prior. Now, men that have partners of childbearing age, again, out of an abundance of precaution, uh, we've recommended as part of the trial to use a condom for 90 days. Uh, however, like I said, uh, trials are ongoing in pharmacokinetics to see how much of the drug really is present in the ejaculate and uh, after the procedure itself and in the urine. All right, perfect. So as you can see, uh, very, very quickly, almost instantaneously, there's a uh, improvement in urine flow as the catheter is taken out. Uh, and that's not new, right? You know, balloon dilation, DVIU, these all uh, have a improvement in, in flow immediately. What What is remarkable about this is the durability of this. So you can see this graph going out for two years uh, with a consistent improvement in that flow as opposed to... Uh, standard endoscopic treatment for placebo. Keep going on here with some slides. So again, we place a well lube. We use 14 French Foley's for these patients at the end of the procedure. Uh, we try not to pass anything through the area once the balloon is, the drug coated balloon is inflated, deflated and removed. I generally recommend uh, NSAIDs uh, to, together with antibiotics as per your normal protocol, mine is to give antibiotics uh, in the operating room as well as for a short period of time afterwards. Um, and the subject should abstain from all sexual activity. This includes masturbation for 14 days. And then for 30 days, they must use protection uh, if they're having sex with a female partner. And those that are having sex with a female partner of childbearing age, we're asking for at least 90 days of, absta of abstaining or using protection. Again, this is until... Uh, we have more data on the pharmacokinetics, and those studies are ongoing. So you can see here, uh, this is just a, a case study as well as 24-month follow-up with a retrograde urethrogram, uh, the durability of the response of a particularly tight um, and uh, very proximal bulb restriction uh, with an improvement, a uh, very good improvement in the, in the flow. These patients are very, very happy afterwards. So, in summary, you know, urethral stricture disease, we all know, uh, although there are guidelines for many different sources, many different countries, many different urologic bodies, we don't always see as reconstructive urologists these patients in our office when they're supposed to. And that could be because of lack of um, availability of reconstructive urologists. That could be for other reasons as well. Um, some patients just have multiple dilations. Some doctors are just comfortable doing that. Um, this is a better way uh, of treating some patients, uh, and this may prevent some of them from progressing uh, to uh, more invasive procedures. So uh, I, I'm very excited about this. Uh, like I said, I've had one patient in that 29 that we treated recur. I did his urethroplasty yesterday, uh, and, uh, you know, I think... Uh, this represents just a change in the paradigm and something that we can offer our patients uh, that will help them. Uh, the durability of response also is, is something that I'm very excited about, and I look forward to the five-year data. So we have a little poll question here. Just after hearing all this evidence um, from Dr. Elliott, um, Dr. Watkin, and uh, I, are you interested in uh, adopting this or learning more about it from the treatment of urethral stricture disease? You could just answer yes or no, or just for select patients.
right? And I think in our next slide here, I'm going to turn it over uh, back again to uh, Professor Watkin to discuss the case study. And most people seem interested in this and I'll be available also to answer any particular questions you have, especially on the technicalities of doing the procedure. Carl, thank you very much, and Sean, for excellent presentations. So we go back to my uh, second opinion case. This was pre-lockdown. This obviously was pre-EAU guidelines, pre-Optolume availability in the UK, uh, and pre-outcome of the open trial, which was a few months later. So bearing that in mind, uh, you may recall that uh, the case, he, he'd been offered a urethroplasty, it was not that keen. So what did I recommend to him? Um, well, he lived 200 miles away uh, and actually it was a telephone consult uh, and I'd had the urethrogram sent over to me. I offered him a flexible cystoscopic guided S-curved dilator over a Terumo guide wire with no catheter. He was straight on the train, arrived and went home again within two hours. Uh, with local anesthetic. Um, I telephoned him in October and his symptom score was zero. He had a normal flow from his perspective and hadn't deteriorated uh, in any way. So, so it tells you that endoscopic treatment is undoubtedly still an option. It's not necessarily a cure, but for, for certain patients and for this patient in particular, it was exactly what he wanted. And if we can improve on this experience, with uh, drug-coated balloons, then we should really be revisiting the role of endoscopic uh, treatment more aggressively, more vigorously than we have done in the past. Uh, even though he was talking to a urethroplasty surgeon, I was still very happy with the outcome and the choice that he made. So if we go on now to Q&A um, and just some take-home messages whilst some questions are coming through. Um, I think we would we'd all agree that this is for short, non-traumatic penobulbar strictures. Uh, that would be uh, most people's view. And probably just for what a first-time patient or one that had had uh, a few recurrences. Um, patients need to be well informed. Uh, they, know, they need to know the short to medium-term outcomes and they need to know the comparative data. And to that end, we're in the process of uh, setting up a, a, a British um, NIHR funded RCT, which is looking at Optolume versus uh, endoscopic treatment with mitomycin as an adjunct versus standard of care. So this trial, which is still going through for funding is called Rebus, and uh, we might be able to uh, give some more information about Optolume uh, going forward on this basis. So, I can see that uh, there are eight questions in the chat and whilst they're being collated, perhaps um, I could ask Sean a question first of all. Sean, how do you know where the proximal end of the stricture is in the balloon? Do you use on-table urethrography with every patient or are you using a historical urethrogram to guide you? What, what's your practice? Uh, the way I've done it is to use on-table urethrography on every patient. Uh, I've done all of these in an ambulatory surgery center, not my office, with a bit of sedation. And I start with urethrography and save that image and then use it as a reference as I uh, pass the balloon later during the study. And, and as you probably saw in uh, Carl's slides, there are these radiographic markers at the proximal and distal end of the balloon and uh, making sure that those uh, span the area of the stricture. Uh, thanks, Sean. And perhaps a question for you, uh, Carl. Obviously, we, you were stressing the importance of not getting the uh, powder moist. And I'm struggling to see how you can do that with the, with the flexible cystoscope, passing it alongside. I, I imagine there's gel, water-based gel in the, in the urethra. So I'm, I'm getting that why you would choose a rigid scope. Um, perhaps, have, what was your thoughts when you were perhaps learning with the flexible cystoscope about this? Uh, so my, my thought 
is, um, you know, in terms of not getting it moist, it really was uh, when you are preparing the device, when you're touching with your, you know, not to touch it with your hands, especially. Once it gets into the urine channel, you know, it has to sit in saline for 60 seconds anyway um, to kind of activate the, uh, the recipient and allow the transfer of the drug. So at that point, you know, once you're introducing it, it's going to be about a minute or so before it's in position anyway. And so that's fine. Um, what was, what is difficult, um, when you're, at least when you're first starting out now, now after doing almost 30 of these patients, I'm very comfortable doing it with a flexible scope and a good assistant. When you're first starting out, sometimes holding the scope, you know, at the meatus, as well as, um, you know, uh, the, the head in your hand, um, and then having someone slide it, uh, next to the scope sometimes can be a little cumbersome. So that's why we had switched over is more for control. Also, I could hold on to the balloon as it was being, being inflated and the scope and watch it at the same time. Um, I use fluoroscopy as Dr. Elliott said, uh, but I also verified, uh, after the pre-dilation with the non-drug coated balloon, I verified that the stricture was dilated to at least 20 French by passing the rigid scope through it. So I was able to see the proximal end at that time. Now, in the future going forward, if I decide not to use a uh, pre-dilation balloon, I would be relying strictly on the retrograde images um, and the markers on fluoroscopy to place it in the correct position. Obviously, the distal marker is very easy because you're right there with the camera and you can place it there. Yeah. Thanks, Carl. Well, now looking through the Q&A, perhaps the, the most obvious question from an anonymous attendee was, uh, and it's to both of you, uh, what complications have you encountered in the use of Optilum? Sean, perhaps you first. I haven't noticed complications that are any different from patients with standard balloon dilation, you know, a little bit of uh, bleeding perhaps for a, a day or two around the catheter, no excess amounts of uh, pain, uh, no excess in infection, and, and that would match with the, the data we see from a uh, robust one and two in terms of uh, complications. They're, they're, they're quite rare and quite minor. Carl? Yes, I, uh, I agree. You know, it's pretty much the same complications or, or symptoms that you would see after a, a di any dilation, you know, some urgency and frequency symptoms. Sometimes some blood around the catheter are dissipated very quickly. Um, we, we didn't have any, you know, uh, serious side effects. We had a couple of patients have reoperations, but they had kidney stones. Um, so, you know, unrelated, obviously, to this. Um, no issues with erectile dysfunction, no issues with uh, urinary incontinence, even on those very proximal strictures where the balloon may have been traversing close to the sphincter. So, you know, that was also something that I was very conscious of um, in terms of placement, but we never had any issues with, uh, with incontinence symptoms afterwards that were new. And I should say, you know, we scoped all these patients at six months, and in no patient was there some kind of a necrotic, non-healing fissure in the urethra as you, as you might be worried about by, by delivering a chemotherapy drug to a, a wound you just created. I had that same experience. There was nothing that was unusual. Um, there are a couple of questions to do with catheters, and I suppose I could perhaps summarize the, the questions into one. Any, any different practice with your urethral catheterization? Are you leaving them longer? Uh, are they getting more catheter irritation? Do you, do you have to worry about the lubricant that you put on the catheter to place it? Is there anything specific you think that might be different for, for catheter care post-operatively? Sean, you first. Uh, you know, I, I really don't do anything different. I, I place the catheter over a wire, but I do that for all my DVIUs and dilations, and it's perhaps extra important in this case because you you prefer to just put the catheter through once and not have to jam it in a couple of times and you know uh, uh, mess up the drug. So putting it over wire is great, and um, no, my my management of the catheter has been the same as normal. I'll take it out after uh, two or three days. And Carl, your, yourself, your practice? Yeah. Well, to be honest with you, I'm using a smaller catheter than I would if I did a DVIU or a urethroplasty. So, you know, and that was because of the study protocol. I was, uh, I was using a 14 French Foley. So to be honest, most patients had an easier time 
uh, with those, uh, with the catheters afterwards. Um, I didn't do anything differently. Uh, I did not place them over a wire. I used a regular catheter, not a council tip catheter. Uh, we did not have 14 French council tip catheter. So I, I placed them, uh, really without any resistance after the dilation, um, and, uh, you know, I actually agree with what Sean said in the future. Maybe I'll utilize, uh, a, order some special council tipped ones to place over the wire. But other than that, you know, there was no difference with, you know, the amount of saline. It was 10 cc's in each balloon and, and the same amount of lubricant. There was nothing unusual. And I don't put catheters in a lot of my patients postoperatively unless they're really young and anxious um, and they might bleed. Um, can you do this without a catheter, do you think? I think you could. We we wanted to have it standardized for the purposes of the study. Sure. But I I would agree with you. I I do several patients uh, in my in my non-optolum patients without a catheter, and I think you could do the same here. I uh, I wonder about. Uh, I I think it would be something that would be reasonable to study in the future because we don't know the effect of the urine passing through and whether that might cause some loss of the drug. So I don't know that we can we can answer for sure yet. Okay. Um, and look, just flicking through the Q&A again, um, one question is, any particular kinds of bulbar strictures that you wouldn't use the Optolume for? And perhaps the counter question, which kind of patients would you think would be better off uh, with Optolume rather than urethroplasty? Sean, any, any biases or, or sort of slanting of your, your clinical decision making? I think I would continue to reserve Optolum for uh, strictures that are uh, second or third time around uh, treatments. I, I wouldn't use it as a first line yet, uh, mostly because of cost. Um, I would probably not use it in extremely short strictures that have better, uh, pretty good success rate with standard DVIU, uh, as you saw in your, uh, in your case you presented. Uh, but if I've got a very short stricture and it's his third or fourth time being treated, then of course I would use the Optolume. Okay, um, I've got one more question. Oh no, some more. Questions. The one, the next one I was going to ask you is: any concerns about patients on anticoagulants? I didn't particularly have any uh, any issues with that. The patients that I had were able to stop the anticoagulation. Um, in my experience, you know, with a, with a DVIU, um, sometimes I ran into a little, a little bit more bleeding in those procedures rather, the, rather than the gradual stretching using a, um, a dilation balloon. So uh, to be honest with you, I think just that five minutes of pressure uh, will do numbers uh, for, uh, you know, helping with bleeding. I would be more likely to use this in a patient that was forced to have anticoagulation uh, than another method. And another one has just come through. Um, would you use the Optolume for recurrent strictures after bulbar urethroplasty and, and or penile urethroplasty? Yeah, I think that the Optolume has proved itself to be particularly useful in the difficult to treat strictures, those have, that have failed uh, two or three other treatments. So. Uh, as an extension of that, I would guess that it would have a, a good role in the management of the difficult recurrences after urethroplasty. I also think it'll prove to have a role in the uh, vesicourethral and anastomotic strictures after radical prostatectomy, perhaps in bladder neck contractures after transurethral resection. Yeah, I also agree. I think that, uh, you know, my, my uh, general algorithm is... Uh, treating a uh, failing uh, endoscopic management proceeding to urethroplasty and failing that doing another endoscopic management before doing a repeat urethroplasty. So I would definitely consider using uh, the optimum balloon um, for those patients uh, to try and prevent that second urethroplasty, which would be, you know, a lot more difficult. Uh, I, I think I'd agree with that strategy. I think your patients would probably be saying the same thing, yeah. actually. Okay. I think that's drawn an end to the q and I'm just looking through the live chat, which is, um, I think we've covered everything. Um, yeah. Um, James, anything coming through from, from uh, the background that we, you'd like us to cover before we, we close, the, uh, close the session? No, I think you've covered everything um, fantastically. So um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to Professor Walk and uh, Professor Elliot and Dr. Coutinho for 
uh, taking the time and also for the for the audience and everyone in the audience for taking the time to join us this evening. Um, we're really grateful um, that we got to share uh, this educational opportunity with you guys. And I hope that you uh, can form a, a very concise clinical opinion. Um, and I look forward to, um, to meeting everybody uh, in the future when it comes to um, the urethral stricture practice and introducing Optolum as part of that as well. Um, and engaging in further conversation. You know, if anyone has any questions, they can come through to myself or they can go through the via the Lavery website or the Eurotronic website. Um, and we are open to, to conversation at any time. So thank you very much, panel. I really appreciate your time and your efforts. And thank you very much to the audience um, and to everyone in the background who made, who's made this possible as well. Um, and we look forward to working with you all in the very, very near future. Uh, thank you, James. And I would just like to thank my colleagues, uh, Professor Sean Elliott and Dr. Carl Coutinho uh, for presenting excellent uh, talks. And also to Baus, who've, been, who've set up the, 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 the educational series over, the, over this year. And I think they've become really popular and we've still got 82 people on the line, which is, which is excellent. So thank you very much, everybody, and good night.